Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another Barometer Readings webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital. And on today's webcast, we will be joined by our very own David Burroughs, the Chief Investment Officer here at Barometer, who will be pleased to give us an update on the macro environment as well as address your questions at the tail end of his conversation. So don't be shy. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca. Or, of course, feel free to send a question via the chat or the uh, Q&A on Zoom. So with that, I turn the conversation over to Dave Burroughs. He was out west visiting our clients last week, and we're glad to have him back. Welcome back, Dave, and nice to see you. Thanks, Pamela. <clears throat> it's great to be back. Um, uh, I hope uh, uh, everybody has been uh, slogging through the markets over the last couple of weeks uh, and uh, and st keeping their head above water. Uh, obviously, it's been a sloppy market going back to sort of the middle of uh, middle of August. Uh, and I thought maybe what we do today is take a sort of a high level top down view. Uh, we have uh, uh, been very focused over the last number of weeks uh, and are working hard at making sure that the portfolios kind of stay in tune with the market. Um, why don't I why don't I kick off just from a high level? Um, you know, as as most People know we we believe we've been in a structural bull market since 2013 for U.S. stocks, uh, and that's not without its ups and downs. It's not without its corrections. The bull market that went between 1981 and 2000 had several uh, good-sized corrections, both in time and in price, as did the bull market that took place between 1951 and 1966. The common characteristic in each case was equities are a great asset class to be invested in. You had to pick your spots and you had to recognize, you know, some important changes. Certainly in 1966, when the market rolled over, the market didn't make a new high until 1982. Uh, and that's a long time to wait. Uh, and clearly, you know, these are the kinds of markets people are most concerned of, you know, big bear market in the early 1970s. Uh, when we fast forward into the 2000s, the tech wreck of 2000 through 2003, and the financial crisis between 2000 to the 2009, you know, are, are things that people worry about. So it has not been our belief that we are headed for that kind of difficulty, but we take things day by day. And our job is to make sure that we assess market activity, uh, look at the market internals to try and recognize change to make sure that we keep portfolios in tune. Uh, we've been in a correction that started in <clears throat> December of 2022. Sorry, yeah, two, sorry, 2000 of 21. 2022 was a difficult year. It's been 21 months from then. We are still 10% from the old highs. Uh, however, this is not an unusual uh, type of bear market to happen in a structural bull, bull market. Uh, and, and obviously, we want to be there when the market takes out the highs, because what you then get is two or three years of substantial returns, <clears throat> and they tend to be sort of broad based. Um, so walking our way through things, you know, we highlight the fact that really this little set of returns that have come since the market's lows in October of 2022 still is a very muted response. Uh, and if it was over, that would certainly be the shortage, shortest of the bull markets going back to the 1930s and with the least productive. Uh, so we think it's unlikely, but certainly we're in a tough time of the year seasonally. People worry uh, and we want to look at what's happening in the market internals. But, you know, we're into a correction and we know that seasonally and annually you tend to have, you know, three to four or five percent corrections. <clears throat> S&P is down about five percent in the month of September. Uh, you know, you might get as much as a one 10 percent correction over the course of a year. But, you know, given the fact that we are so uh, still so close to the bear market of 2022, think that it's very unlikely we get something significant here. When we look at the S&P, certainly it's been pulling back. We talked over the last few weeks about the fact that we were seeing some sloppiness in our short and longer term models, uh, that we were being more cautious, that we were not adding new positions uh, and that we had to take. The portfolios position by position. Um, the bull market, uh, we believe, started uh, a structural, sorry, a, a cyclical bull market started in October of last year. We made a series of higher lows since then. We're in a channel that has been fairly consistent since it began, but we're now getting to the low end of the channel. When we talked about it <clears throat> in the second week of August, we thought it was possible the market could pull back and fill this gap that was left behind 
in the middle of May going into June, uh, because very often when you leave a hole on the chart or where there's a vacuum, you'll go back and fill it. And that would take us down to sort of the 4,200 level. So we're getting awfully close. 4,226 uh, was uh, where things were trading just shortly before we started the webcast. Uh, and so we're getting very close to the low end. And seasonally, we're getting close to the end of the of the week, week seasonal period, which tends to run into sort of the beginning of the second week of October. When we look at the NASDAQ, it's a slightly different picture. So, <clears throat> you know, there was cause for concern early in the year when NASDAQ ripped higher into May, June. And since then, the relative strength for the NASDAQ 100 has been waning. Now we know that this is a very crowded part of the market. We know that it gave extraordinary returns as people got excited about AI and the things that that might mean for large cap tech. And we know that a huge percent of this year's returns have come in large cap tech. But in the middle of March, we saw the market broaden out and include some other very important groups that are under owned and relatively uh, less expensive. Uh, and certainly, you know, could be in the early stages of what is could could be a longer term structural bull market. As we sit right now, NASDAQ still sitting well above the 150 day moving average and 200 day moving average. We did take out these lows today. <clears throat> and we have talked about the fact that we have had less and less exposure to large cap tech. Outside of the US, Asia continues to be quite strong. Japan trading within a whisper of its multi-year highs. Uh, and uh, India, the same thing. So we, we have talked through the course of the year about the fact that there have been markets outside of the U.S. that are providing returns this year. We don't want to ignore that because when global markets start to outperform, they can outperform for a long time. Let's talk about fixed income for a moment. This has been a hot topic of conversation. It's been our view that we put in a structural low or a generational low in interest rates in 2020. We watched interest rates fall from 1981 to 2020 in a series of fits and starts that made lower lows and lower highs. During that period, there are certain parts of the market that were greatly benefited by falling interest rates. And from an asset class perspective, clearly real estate is an asset that has been helped by falling rates, which makes mortgages more affordable. And certainly from a commercial real estate perspective, buildings went from trading at a 10% cap rate, ultimately at the market's peak at a 2% cap rate. And with long-term yields going higher, hard for them to trade at those values. So this is an asset class that's under pressure. We want to focus on assets that do well in a reflationary environment because we don't think this is a short-term move. When we look at the aggregate bond index that peaked <clears throat> in, the, in the spring of 2020, there has been a lot of pain in this group. This is an ETF that looks across various maturities and various issuer qualities. And we are virtually trading after a bounce early in 2023, basically back at the lows. Now, the difficulty of course is that risk averse investors saw higher rates and thought, here's my opportunity to lock in some higher rates, maybe get a better return. If you look at what's happened to an investor in the TLT, which is the long-term US government bond ETF, it's now down over, sorry, over 50%, 51%. Uh, when we look at the Canadian broad bond index, it's trading on the low. And in fact, if we were to go around the world, we'd see the same thing across multiple sovereign bond markets. So it's been a very difficult time to be a bond investor. And the interesting thing about that is that the worse it got, the more money has moved in. Now, the question is, how long do these folks who have been accumulating the long end of the bond market stay in, given the fact that they are seeing lower and lower lows. We know that we are now in the third year of a bear market for bonds. That hasn't happened since the late 1700s. So cash going in to bonds and cash, money coming out of stocks, despite the fact that stocks have been outperforming, looking at it another way. These are the assets going into TLT. This is the price of TLT. Clearly it's been a difficult period of time for bond investors. Looking at it very simple, if we compare the return from the S&P 
versus the return from TLT, it clearly favors stocks, whether stocks are correcting right now or not. Let's look at commodities. Commodities bottomed a bear market that started in 2008 and 2020, had a first leg higher and during the Fed's tightening cycle, went into a sideways to down consolidation. Now, 14 months of consolidating prices can feel like a long time, except if we're looking at long-term charts, markets take a long time to resolve. Well, resolve they did in the spring of 2023, and commodity prices have been rising since then. Yet, we talked about the fact that in July, more investors had become underweight commodities while commodity prices were going higher. If we compare commodities to the equally weighted S&P 500, this is to today, you can see three straight months of sharp outperformance. Now, the job of a manager is to recognize change and make sure that portfolios line up with it. Now, I know the interest in the beginning of the year was to own large cap tech because large cap tech is what led in the last cycle. And these are companies we know and love. Commodities are generally unloved because for a decade they did very poorly. And there's lots of skepticism as to whether, in fact, these can perform the way that they have. But if we're going to have electric vehicles and if we're going to have green energy, we need commodities. If there's going to be infrastructure spending in North America and there's going to be reshoring, we need commodities. So the, the, the proof is in the pudding. Price supports the fact that this asset class is outperforming equities currently. It's also outperforming bonds. So given our choices, commodities would be a group that we want to have exposure to, equities relative to bonds, and bonds are an asset that we want to try to avoid. Now, some updated data. This is commodities performance in the bottom and the number of investors who are overweight. There is no change despite the fact that commodities are performing better. From the middle of March, when commodities made their turn, and when some of the leadership groups started to expand beyond tech, we're pretty happy with the way things are going. TSX up 4% over that period. This is to uh, yesterday. The aggregate bond index down 3.5%. The Canadian broad bond index down 5.72. Our equity pool is up 9.3%. The uh, macro global macro pool up 6%. And our income pool, despite the weakness in fixed income, up 5.3%, beating both stocks and bonds. So let's take a look and see what's coming out of the data now. We don't have to be everywhere. Our job is to focus in assets that have a constructive tailwind. There are parts of the market maybe we want to avoid. So our first job is to identify market leadership and focus on those areas. We will always want to watch for change and in the absence of leadership, have an ability to hold some cash or avoid big parts of the market. When our models are negative, we have to be more cautious. So we start from a top-down perspective, try to identify asset classes, like say equities and commodities we wanna have exposure to. We try to identify sectors or themes within those groups that are showing out performance. And then our job is to find securities with financial characteristics and technical characteristics so that support the fact that they're leaders within their groups. Our portfolio is made up of a combination of our top-down work, identifying neighborhoods to focus in and finding securities to express our view. And that's dynamic, it changes. When our work shows deterioration and breadth, we have to be more cautious. What does it mean? Every bull market in history has been driven by the fact that over time, more and more securities participate in a rally. When you get to a point late in a rally where the market starts to narrow or the weaklings start to fall away, you gotta recognize that and be willing to reduce your exposure. It also means that if market breadth is contracting, you don't put any new positions on until breadth starts to resolve. When breadth is deteriorating, our job is to have a little bit of extra cash to tighten up the stop losses that we use and stop putting on new positions. Okay, so on August the 8th, we highlighted that some of our short-term indicators were showing weakness. Percent of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average, particularly in certain sectors, were fading. 
percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum was deteriorating, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows had started to fall, and percent of stocks with uh, above the 150-week moving average started to falter. But the long-term indicators were positive. As of today, things have continued to weaken through a seasonally weak period of the year. Percent of stocks in the NYC that are in uptrends has fallen from about 60% to about 35%. And the same thing has happened on a global basis. From a short-term indicator perspective, percent of stocks trading above the 50-day, percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum, percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows, and percent of stocks above the 150-day moving average are moving towards oversold. Now, as it stands, seasonality is playing out as might be typical. I know last week, Diana, in my absence, talked about the fact that we are in a tricky time and we've got to keep our wits about us. So let's talk about the things that aren't working, things that we need to avoid, and look at the characteristic. From a sector exposure standpoint, utilities have been about the worst sector to own. And that would make sense given the fact it's a high dividend paying sector with very little economic growth. They act a lot like bonds. So as bond prices have been falling, bond proxies or things that act like bonds have been underperforming. Now we've highlighted underperformance in utilities all year long and talked about the fact that this is a group that we want to avoid. What else is a bond proxy? Well, consumer staples. Again, higher dividend paying stocks, low dividend growth rate, low economic sensitivity, and clearly underperforming. This blue line is relative performance versus the S&P. And you can see that's been weakening since March. Real estate. This is an ETF that owns a broad range of uh, real estate investment trusts in the U.S. Relative strength has been falling steadily over the course of the last two years, and today made a relative strength new low and a price new low. Telecom, another bond proxy, underperforming. Infrastructure, another group making lower lows and lower highs. Now let's go beyond the bond proxies and talk about defensive sectors as a whole. A lot of the healthcare sectors have had a difficult time, including biotech and medical devices. Again, relative strength new lows as of today and some serious price deterioration. Retail, retail XRT ETF, also significantly underperforming. So there's some parts of the market that are having a really tough time, but at the same time, they're not all acting the same. While correlations have been going up, meaning sectors behaving more and more like one another, there are some clear outliers. So we spent a lot of time talking about energy. We want to continue to focus on the leadership. After many years of a bear market, a group becoming very underowned. Pension funds sold these assets because they weren't ESG. And a lot of <clears throat> investors chose to walk away because a 10-year bear market can take a big toll. Post getting through sort of where the market began to believe that the Fed may be done, energy has taken off and is leading the market. So we talked about oil prices working their way higher. We talked about companies like CNQ. We add in here Imperial Oil. We have a lot of different exposure across both oil and gas producers in Canada and the US. We know that inventory continues to fall. We know that capital spending has been falling because it's an unpopular group. And we know that the rig count continues to weaken. Cash flow, free cash flow yields in a lot of these companies are above 20%. So beyond the capital that's required to continue to operate the business, the cash that's being generated will be used to buy back shares and to increase dividends. We think that in a world of, of higher than typical inflation, dividend growth becomes really important to investors. And we think that this is an under group that's relatively inexpensive. And clearly, energy large versus large cap growth has been outperforming over the last number of months. Uranium, we talked about two weeks ago, and we talked about in the end of August, it continues to outperform. The uranium producers like Cameco and NextGen have had an excellent couple of weeks uh, and clearly coming out of a long period of underperformance. And part of that would be the fact that spot prices for uranium 
to be delivered over the next number of months have moved sharply higher and there is not offerings coming in behind. <clears throat> financials. In the financials, it looks like uh, uh, insurance is likely to continue to lead. The relative outperformance in May, April, uh, sorry, uh, uh, May, June, and July paused in August and then has moved sharply higher over the last few weeks, including <clears throat> a number of companies like Fairfax Financial, which is a Canadian equivalent to a Berkshire Hathaway run by Prem Watsa uh, and Progressive Corp. Now, we have a number of companies in the insurance space. We have very little banking exposure, although I will say JP Morgan, relative to the bank ETF, continues to outperform. This is a top 10 holding at Barometer. So <clears throat> let's talk about tech. Now, the XLK is an ETF made up of large cap tech. Apple, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Broadcom, Adobe, Cisco, Salesforce, etc. The biggest weights would be Apple and Microsoft. <clears throat> we highlighted in the summer that relative outperformance had started to wane. And as a result, we were reducing our exposure. NVIDIA, which has been an important position for the firm, we cut uh, in size about a month ago, uh, and we've exited our position in Oracle. Now, <clears throat> tech relative to energy did have a nice move higher in the early part of the year, but has started to wane. NVIDIA continues to be a very strong holding, acting better than 99% of companies in the S&P 500 so far this year. Okay, so what does that all mean? <clears throat> it means that we're being a little bit more cautious. It means that we have cash and short-term bonds. The average account has between 15 and 20% in dry powder. Bonds due in less than two years and cash sitting on the sidelines. Our largest weight is financials and we're there for the dividend growth. Followed by energy, we have a significant underweight in technology, although still some important companies. Industrials remains an overweight because the reflationary traits of industrials and the strong order books support prices. Materials continues to be close to a three times weight for the market. And on the other side, things that do well, sorry, do poorly when bonds do poorly, utilities, real estate, consumer staples, communication services, and healthcare are significant underweights. <clears throat> Look, Seasonally, we can expect some choppiness still for the next couple of weeks. Our short-term indicators are getting oversold and things could turn any time. It's important during a period of weakness to make sure we're playing some defense. Over the period from the end of August, uh, the, yes, the Qs are down just about 5%, the S&P is down just about 4%, the income portfolio is down about 2.4, the global portfolio is down one, equity portfolio is down three, we're comfortable that volatility is being muted. Now, there is a silver lining. When the market has had negative Augusts and September, sorry, when the market was up 10% going into September and you had a negative August, September to December was up an average of 9%, 100% of the cases since 1954. Volatility has come up a little bit, but remains way below levels we were at when the market was on a weak footing. When we look at <clears throat> the transcripts of companies that have been reporting earnings, over the next num last number of months, the number of companies referencing the risk of recession has been falling steadily. And when we look at the bond market's assessment of credit risk or the risk of not getting paid by corporate issuers, the excess return being demanded by investors is falling, not rising. So if we were headed for recession, you would expect rates would be moving lower. They're moving higher. If we were headed for recession, you would expect defensive sectors would be leading the market. They're lagging. If you were expected we were going into recession, you would expect bond investors to be demanding excess return to take corporate risk the risk premium is falling. Now, seasonally, September is a difficult period. In green, the last 10 years, uh, in, um, in uh, uh, sorry, gold, uh, since 1950, we see across the board, September tends to be a difficult month. 
And that's not unusual. We talked about this over the last six weeks. Having said that, despite the fact that October generally starts weak, it winds up being one of the better months of the year. November is the best month of the year, and December tends to be a pretty good month. When the market was down 1% or more, both in August and September, when you looked out for the fourth quarter, the market was up 92% of the time, an average of 7%. So we'll see. We have some great positions in the portfolios. We've got cash we can put to work when our models start to turn positive. There is some very clear leadership in the market that's bucking the trend. And we put one foot in front of the other, step by step. But at some point, this cyclical bear market comes to an end. I think it was October of 2022. We want to make sure we're positioned for what comes in the two to three years that follows a structural bear market, sorry, a cyclical bear market. And as it sits, we're comfortable with our holdings. If things get more difficult, we're certainly willing to raise more cash. Uh, we have stops on all of our positions uh, and we'll see how things play out over the next couple of weeks. We've got lots of flexibility and we'll be back next week to talk about what's gone on since then. Pamela, and any questions? Dave, we have so many great questions. So the first question comes from Alejandro. Thank you so much for watching us every week, Alejandro. We appreciate it. Uh, he says, good afternoon, David. Do you see oil climbing to $100 or further high? Okay, WTI. Bear market started in 2008. Did rally through and make close to make new highs in 2013 and 2015, sorry, 2014. During this period, the energy sector fell to the lows in 2020, down 90%. So <clears throat> that being said, we came back and made a new high and have consolidated through the course of time while we went through the Fed tightening cycle and has resolved higher. My guess is that we probably move ultimately into the mid $100 range, $140 to $160. So we'll see when we look at the BNO, Brent, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a similar picture. Um, we've broken out from the range it was in from 2015, consolidated through the course of the Fed's tightening period, and broken out to the upside. Um, so I think that we got a long way to go. We're going to take it step by step. Uh, I'm watching uh, energy equities, which have clearly been outperforming, and they're um, generating just a ton of cash. So <clears throat> we want to own things that have relatively low dividend payouts, that have an ability to grow dividends. And there's just a ton of companies that we can own that we think are far more attractive than owning fixed income or high dividend payers. Dave, the next question um, comes from another viewer say, asking, do you buy into Jamie Di Diamond's idea this week that we could see rates touch 7%? What would happen to the equity markets if that were to happen? Max curious too. You know, so... <laughs> It's, it's like the when you ask your caddy if you can get there with a five iron, and he says, eventually. You know, the thing is, um, rates going to seven. It depends completely on how they go there. If, if long-term yields rallied like stink and we went there in three months, you can bet the stock market's going to have a hard time. The market hates sharp moves. But we talked about at the beginning of the webcast, I think we're likely to have 10 or 15 years, if not 20, of rising rates in fits and starts. But every cycle is likely to see a higher high and a higher low. So my guess is we're getting close. Like I think that we might see five or five and a quarter. My guess is given the technical setup, we are going higher. Now, <clears throat> if we were headed for a hard landing recession, it's unlikely yields continue higher. And when I look at the leadership in the market, it's more economically sensitive stocks that are leading. So my guess is yields are gonna continue to go higher, but I don't think in a hurry. So in the in the next, let's call it six months, it would not surprise me to see, see yields at five or five and a quarter. I really don't think we see 7%. There's, there's, there's a couple of ways bonds sell off. They sell off because there's inflation. 
they sell off because the economy is growing and is resilient, or they sell off because there's credit risk. Well, right now, if we look at credit default swaps and, <clears throat> and um, rate spreads, there doesn't appear to be a major credit problem out there. So that leaves inflation or economic growth. We know inflation data has been coming down. It's still elevated. But we also know that discussion of recession has been falling off the map. So my guess is rates can go a little bit higher. They are going to have pressure, continue to have pressure on bond proxy assets, which we saw today, them making relative new lows. Um, but I don't think we see 7% in the near term. The last thing, you got to remember that Jamie Dimon is supposed to be the most conservative bank CEO. And JP Morgan is clearly the most conservative bank. His job is to consider all of the possibilities. He didn't say we're going to seven. He said, I don't think people have factored in the possibility we could go to seven. And he's just trying to lay it out there that it's not impossible. So, uh, no, I don't think it's likely we're going to 7%. Thanks so much, David. The the remainder of the questions, I feel like you've already addressed uh, on the call. They were oil and gas specific. So um, lots of questions on oil and gas today from our viewers. So with that, David, I'll leave you with the final word. And thanks again to everyone who is joining us. And we look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. Yeah. So, you know, Pamela, I just say this. I, I recognize that the that the layout of the deck that we're using in some ways is repetitive. Um, but it's also meant to be transparent. If things start to change, you're going to see the charts start to look differently. And our job, I think the job of a manager is to identify <clears throat> new areas of market strength and get focused there, whether the sentiment is positive or negative. And I would say for many of the leadership groups, sentiment continues to be really negative and they continue to be under owned. If things start to change, our job is to change the portfolio. So incrementally over the last number of months, you can see our exposure to large cap growth stocks coming down. You could see our exposure to energy working its way higher. Now, so long as these themes stay in place, I'm confident that we finish the year pretty well and we set up a really good next two or three years. If we've really seen a shift in the long-term secular trend for commodities and energy, there's going to be a lot of money made. You know, in the in the bull market of the 2000s, tech resources and CNQ went up between 700 and 1000 percent. So I'm not saying that's what's going to happen, but I'm saying it's a possibility. We have to understand the possibilities, just like Jamie Dimon is saying 7 percent is a possibility. But market indicators do point in that direction. So we'll continue to look at these things week by week. If you got questions, send them in. Uh, if there's something you're too shy to talk about on the webcast, uh, don't hesitate to give us a call or send us an email. We're happy to answer the questions. Uh, and certainly in between calls, don't hesitate to follow us on Twitter at Barometer CA. Uh, we try to put up things sort of daily that we're uh, noticing and uh, hopefully it's useful. So Pamela, thanks so much for hosting today and uh, we'll be on again next week. Thanks, thanks David. Everybody.